Next, we hear from Stacy Scott, who is chair of the Accessibility Office at Taylor and Francis. And Stacy is going to draw on her experiences, both as a blind mathematician, followed by a career in publishing, to share her insights into accessibility and publishing today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? I hear you very well. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Stacey Scott. So I work as the head of accessibility for Taylor and Francis group. Uh, Taylor and Francis, for those of you who may not know, is a large scholarly publisher. Um, my uh, journey that led me to Taylor and Francis started off with me again. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who was born blind, uh, so I had no useful vision. Um, much like uh, several of the, of the other speakers. It's, it's really wonderful for me to be in the presence of so much lived experience. It's fantastic. Um, I, I think sometimes when we're dealing with, uh, you know, matters of accessibility and, and things seem so huge and on a great level, it's, it's, it's actually really great to know that there are people who are experiencing the same thing as other people and it's it's been great to hear the other the other speakers and and <laughs> just it's so many things that they've said resonating with me so strongly so um as mentioned I, I i am a blind person and so had an education where i was educated in mainstream school and started um at university um after my my uh, school education so i started off I, I was very good at maths and science and, and things at school, but it wouldn't it didn't occur to me to do that at university. So I started off doing a lot of your HSS stuff. So, you know, so social sociology, psychology, things like that. And uh, I whilst all of my you know flatmates and friends from university were down the pub, um, I was probably like most panelists, um, standing in, in front of a scanner, um, desperately trying to scan journals and books, only to find that the one I'd scanned wasn't the correct book, or it was upside down, and it was back to front, it didn't have what I needed, it wasn't in focus, it, it was so, so difficult. And so this was sort of my my start to the accessibility journey, I guess, because at school level, I'd had so much support and to start at university level with very little was a massive gap. And so all these things that I thought would be there weren't there. And it, and it was really, really challenging um, to be able to access the subjects that I, I wanted to do. So bizarrely, I decided to go from uh, one extreme to the, ne the next. I thought I, I can't manage scanning all of this stuff. I, I just, there's no time to actually do the work. Um, so I ended up, uh, I accidentally went into a maths lecture one day and, and found that I was able to follow it and I was able to, to do the work afterwards without having to scan, uh, you know, a thousand books and, and journals. And so I decided to switch to maths. And as we've heard from the other speakers, this comes with its own set of problems, um, you know, very different to well, different and similar, I guess, to the ones if you take up an HSS subject. So I didn't have 100 books to scan. It was very much based on lecture materials and uh, classroom work. The, this, though, meant that, you know, because it was math and there wasn't a way to to read it um back then certainly not a way that was was accessible to me using a screen reader this meant that i had to get a, a support worker to to help me read and write all of my my mathematics uh, when i was at university thankfully i had a lot of support um from the the department eventually which which was really uh, fantastic to have but the the thing that made it stand out to me to be so inaccessible I would say would be my final year project when we all had to pick a topic and, and write about it and that involved a lot of research and I found that it absolutely none of the research was accessible to me because you can't you couldn't you know you can't scan in an equation it wouldn't read it to me I couldn't research it on the internet none of it would read it to me and so when you have somebody supporting you in that it's in that environment you know they need to know what it is that you're looking up and it was just it was so so difficult um to do that and i really felt that lack of independence 
again with the bin, you mentioning independence you know if you rely on because you, you would get some people who would say oh well that's a solution right it's a it's a workaround it's a reasonable adjustment uh have somebody you know support you throughout your university and potentially yes you could argue that however when it comes to going to get a job you you face the same level the same gap um in what you're able to access and so you know i had a first class degree in maths at the end of it and i couldn't get a job because a i i couldn't access properly all the information that i needed to in stem related content but also employers just didn't believe that a blind person could do anything in stem and and that, that was an attitude that i saw repeated in multiple places in multiple environments multiple countries blind people do not do science maths things like that so eventually i ended up working for um an international development charity um on education and social inclusion for people with disabilities and that showed me that you know the problems that we were having in the united kingdom with access to stem um were also true in the countries that i was then fortunate enough to work in so across africa india bangladesh and it really ignited a a, a passion in me to uh help to support users getting access to to the content that they needed because i saw far too often in this country as well as others um blind people who are just not able to access the level of education that they wanted or that they were capable of um and so accessing this content absolutely became my passion so after working in international development for a while i then went and i ran the rnib bookshare service so you may have heard of bookshare the us version of from benetech we had one in the uk as well called rnib bookshare and for those of you who don't know it's a platform where you can host um you can host publishers can host books so that they can be accessed by people with a variety of reading requirements so that could be people who are visually impaired but it could also be dyslexia dyspraxia adhd uh, physical difficulties in holding a printed book uh, so many different um uh, abilities and so working in bookshare was was fantastic because i i was able to partner with with so many wonderful publishers who put their books onto that platform and it meant that those books were then available to to people who needed them and uh, you know bookshare both rnb bookshare and bookshare us are uh, both over a million books um each and so there's so much content to choose from there and you know making it accessible making it born accessible and user friendly is of it's 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 the you know it's the raison d'etre for both of those services and so it was wonderful to be able to work on that and to see the difference that that made i then took a course um that i then used bookshare for um and the difference from when i was at university to what it was like uh, you know a few years ago when i took that course was incredible just being able to log on to open the book to read it with the screen reader ah oh, no more scanner the scanner's got long gone um it was fantastic so after doing that i decided you know let's let's get in even deeper and so i went to work for taylor and francis which is where i am now um as head of accessibility and this involves anything that our customers would interact with so it's accessibility across the business and that's everything from journals to books to marketing making our social media content as accessible as we can including all text capping the hashtags everything like that so it's it's very varied um and and all of it is is so important but some of the key um things that we work on of course is looking at both content and access to that content so what i mean by that is for example um we make sure that uh, all of our books are on rnib bookshare bookshare us and access text network in canada so that they can be accessed by people around the globe um all of our books um are we're currently in a process of converting all epub 2s to epub 3s to make sure that all of our content is in the most accessible friendly format so we have about 160,000 um epub 3s and same with our journals we make sure that all of our journals post 2019 um are available in pdf epub and html 
and it's absolutely customer choice. And so we also include with that a built-in screen reader tool. And so customers can log on and read immediately using our built-in tools. They can have it read back to them. Um, and this has been so helpful to, to customers with visual impairments, but also with, with dyslexia or to some customers who, who get tired reading um, after a short amount of time. Um, we also have over two and a half thousand books that we would call completely accessible because they have alt text throughout the entire title. Um, and this is this is growing exponentially. And it's a it, it's massively as a result of our new author driven um, alt text program. And this is where we have our authors submit. Uh, alt text for their content. And one of the key reasons for this is that who understands their content better than the person that's writing it themselves. And so we're, we're very much on board with our authors. We provided a, a hub where authors can learn exactly how to incorporate alt text into their work, why it's necessary, and they can get um, clear examples of what good alt text looks like. And we also hold um, a, you know, a small award every year for both HSS and STEM um, for the best old text titles. And so this is this is growing um, and having our, our editors um, and our editing assistants get on board with this to support the authors has been uh, you know, really crucial to that as well. So that's a, a brief look at content. And I talked about you know, both content and access to the content, and that includes our platforms. So we make sure that our platforms are fully accessible as well, because it's not enough to make an accessible book if you then put it on an ex an, a non-accessible platform. So making sure our platforms are accessible and user-friendly is, is part of it, and it's really important. So one of the th key things that, that we want is to be able to, to make our content as inclusive as possible. So, you know, making sure that there's as is, is many formats that can support the needs of our customers as possible so that people can choose what works best for them. And so one of the things that always surprises people is if we consider Braille, for example, now, whether we're looking at content on our own platform or on Bookshare or on IB Bookshare, it's, it's incredible to think that hard copy Braille, as you can imagine, uh, a large book, um, Potentially, you know, you imagine carrying your school books around, you're putting them in a wheelbarrow and trying to get them from class to class because they are hefty. There is an option for digital Braille, and this is what a lot of people um, haven't seen before. And what this means is, is you can have a refreshable device where the Braille raises and drops in, in a device in your hands. And so every time you go to a new line, that refreshes. And so you can actually access any book, any journal, the entire Bookshare and IB Bookshare platform, uh, sorry, catalog in Braille. And so you can basically fit over a million books in your bag, in your in your pocket. It's it's incredible from where from where it was before. And that's not to say there's no case for hard copy Braille, you know, having it brailled out in an embosser is also uh, an option. And so again, it's making sure that those options are available. But in order to create good Braille books, books that are actually readable, they need to be formatted correctly, they need to be accessible. And so making sure that they're in a format with hierarchies, with headings, that they're structured properly um, is, is absolutely crucial. It's, it's not enough just to Braille out a book or just simply convert it to EPUB to make it accessible. So. Um, Looking at everything that that, that happens at, at Taylor and Francis, for example, um, you know, it, the accessibility journey, it takes a long time. Um, you have to embed it into everything that you're doing in terms of your processes. And you absolutely don't want to retrofit accessibility because it will take a lot of time and a lot more. It would cost a lot more money and take up a lot more resource. And so in order to to do this, uh, Taylor and Francis, Francis first created a group that was a, a, an accessibility allyship across the business. And so it had people from all different departments in it who were keen on making their content accessible, whether it was books, journals or marketing materials. This group came together to really push forward that agenda that actually everything needs to be born accessible. And so we had, you know, very it was a, it was a great noise to have from the business from people working across different departments to say 
this is something that we think is key and we need it to be considered. You need those, those champions dedicated to accessibility. And then the final thing that we, we had was you need ownership at the, that's at the uh, relatively senior level. And that's why Taylor and Francis employed me so that somebody could build a strategy and make sure that the, the accessibility initiatives um, continued to adhere to, to relevant standards such as the European Accessibility Act or the WCAG standards. Um, and also that the strategy aligned across the different departments. So for example, when we're looking at video solutions, we don't want three or four or five different companies coming in offering different solutions. We want the solution that, that works the most. And whether that's one or two, that's absolutely fine. But we don't want things happening in silos because it slows things down. Um, so basically, in conclusion, um, you know, when I think about my own experience and, and I think about how things are now, I certainly consider that we have come a very, very long way. As I mentioned, from you know doing a course at university to doing a course a few years ago was like night and day. Absolutely incredible. But we do have further to go. We've talked about it here. We still have access to STEM issues, but you know, we are. I think we're at a very exciting time with the European Accessibility Act. There's a lot of development in in STEM access and I really feel like we're finally turning that corner we're seeing a lot of change we're seeing a lot more publishers who are, are driven um, to, to making their content and their platforms accessible as chair of the publishing accessibility action group for the publishers association UK I interact with publishers and vendors on a very regular basis and I'm seeing a, a great change in in the trend now whether that's uh, you know uh, motivation through morals or it's the European Accessibility Act I, I don't really mind I'm just absolutely divided, delighted that that we are seeing those changes and the reason for that is because you know what I what I like to think about is you know when we thought, talk about making a book accessible especially in education it's not really about making that book accessible it's about making that content that course accessible making that whoever needs to use that book or that journal in an alternative format if they don't have it they don't have access to key content that could help them or enable them to to pass their exams and it's a very re it's very it's a very real thing to consider that actually by not having the accessible content available then people aren't actually able to then go on and, and make their own life choices. So they're not able to build livelihoods and to make the money that they need. They're not able to have the same life choices as everyone else. So it starts with a book, but it very much ends with people making life choices. Having things that are born accessible means that people are included from the very start and can make their own decisions and choices in life. And for me, that's incredibly, incredibly important. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening to me. I'll now hand back.